welcome to the podcast. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I saw uh, the Rogan and Lex Friedman conversation um, and kind of just pulled a couple of clips from it. I wanted to show you guys. Um, Lex likes to talk about the human condition a lot. Um, and so there's a couple of clips where he uh, mentions some of those things and, and Rogan pushes back and they kind of just have a conversation. I thought there was a handful of them that were interesting. I want to um, just kind of play you guys them and see what you guys think. So this is a clip one where Lex is just asking about if we're able to move beyond the human condition of jealousy and rivalry and competition. Um, here's Rogan's answer. Do you think it's po it really is possible to uh, to move beyond this stage? Yeah. Is it possible this is the optimal? This this greed, the possibility of other people being able to control you because of greed or desire for power, the the weird relationship we have with sex of always chasing it and not getting it and then getting it and then that 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 weird dynamic and the pleasure you get from a good steak or food, mm. all of that, just the pleasures or whatever the hell music is. Like, yeah, what is that? whatever the hell music is is the best question, right? Because all the other ones, if it seems like those are just human rewards, right? Like the reason why it feels good to have sex is because if you have sex, then your genes carry on. So it gives you a reward. It's really a, a nice biological trick. So it's food, tastes great, good for you. You'll stay alive. You need to, you need nourishment for yeah, your body. Smell that's it. That's not why <sighs> you love it. Right, that's, because, but that's you a, love it because of these human rewards. No, 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 no. That's a simplistic explanation. Sure that's it not is. Ex, that's not explaining the subjective reality of what it feels like. Of course it's Fasting not. a lot. But it's after also fasting, true. fasting, eating a good steak. Oh, yeah. No, well, you after can't explain that with a body. Being about, in the cold and taking a hot shower. I okay. mean, you're in the cold for days camping and you take a hot shower. It's the greatest feeling you'll ever have in your life. Yeah, you can uh, do an evolutionary biology explanation. But like, how, how do you you can you can you can reduce every beautiful human experience to an, a, a biological explanation? Yes. But I think you actually lose a lot of the things that aliens are jealous of. You, I, <laughs> the, I love that bombshell at the end. <laughs> <laughs> that aliens are jealous of. <laughs> right. By the way, aliens are jealous of this. Yeah. He um he really does kind of touch on something Verveki also speaks on of like uh just the the. Reality of the subjective experience. And he, uh, Verveke says something like, you know, you can never like scientifically explain the greenness of something. Like, mm. like what it's like to, to see green as opposed to like just a biological explanation of hit, the light hitting your retina and whatever. You can yeah. describe green as comparison to other colors, but not the experience of green. Yeah. And that's what like Lex is really getting at. Mm. Right. Yeah. It seems like there's... um. Uh, we're we're getting on the we're hitting on the philosophical essence. Yep. You know, like what is the essence of green? Yeah. Like, well, yeah. no one really knows, but uh -huh. you have like the actualized green, which is my experience of green. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's also trying to hit on this, like what is the essence of humanity? Yeah. At least I that's so. that's that's how I took it. Mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of his his idea of getting outside of uh, I, or, I I don't know. I, I almost took it as transcending some of these pleasures. Like, will we ever get beyond mm -hmm. uh, the experience, these pleasurable experiences that we have? To which I think the answer is always going to be no. Yeah, um, right. Because he, the essence of humanity that I think he's trying to get at is a a Christian view. Mm -hmm. If uh, there, there's some other later clips that we're going to get into, but I think what he's what he's betraying is his unconscious Christianness yeah, that right. a lot of people have, mm -hmm. because we we have this inclination or we have this um, propensity to believe that the, the fallen nature that we have now is not right. Like, can we ever move mm -hmm. beyond jealousy? Can we ever move beyond uh, rivalry? Right, and that that betrays a a a view of Christians redeemed by grace. If that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, we we want to believe that the essence of humanity aren't, aren't these negative uh, connotations. Right. Right. But yeah, it, I, maybe it is. Right. Without grace, I don't know. I but. I mean, the way that that clip was from uh, the the essence of that clip, I thought was he was getting at he's pointing at a um, transcendent reality. Mm -hmm. Um. And it sounded like Joe Rogan's answer was trying to deny our transcendent reality, and so he was Lex was coming at it from a um, point of uh, like universal inclination towards good, 
Um, it's like we can all agree that when you eat a steak, it mm. tastes amazing. Um, you know, mm. um, all these like pleasures, like why are these universal yeah. things, right? Mm. If we're just, if there's no transcendent truth, there's no transcendent good, then we shouldn't be able to talk about um, steak being cooked properly right. and enjoying it on a universal level. I, the, yeah. the, I, well, and, and Rogan's answer, being, uh, reducing it to um, biology, mm-hmm. I think is a common rebuttal to uh, like a, a universal transcendent. Mm-hmm. Um, but Lex was, he was good on pushing back. Um, because ultimately, when you, when you uh, carry that logic all the way through, um, that biological um, uh, logic, you end up um, at the end where it's like, well, then that, so we're assuming that life is better than death. That's what yeah. you're assuming. Mm-hmm. Life is better than death. Um, you know, it, the, the sex feels good mm-hmm. because you want to propagate your species, mm-hmm. because you have to propagate life. Mm-hmm. You eat because uh, you have to live, right. right? It's all about fighting for life, mm-hmm. you know, in this Darwinian mm-hmm. sense. But then, so then you butt up against this barrier, life is better than death, mm-hmm. says who? Right. Like, yeah. that is a metaphysical claim, to yep. say life is better than right. death. You can't put that under a microscope, um, especially considering that all things die right if if all of nature is tending towards death right then why the heck are we fighting for life right uh like that's yeah. that's the metaphysical barrier that um that's left unsaid there mm-hmm. um and so yeah carry your you know biological explanation all the way through you, that still doesn't give me a metaphysical explanation for um the the um the importance of life over death right. um, you're claiming as a good you're claiming as a universal good that life is better than death uh jonathan um, Peugeot mentioned too that like uh Darwinism was going to bring back Plato because hmm. because by saying natural selection, you're implying that there's something being selected as a good uh, versus a right. non-good. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it's not it's not random. Like Darwin's proposing that this is like looking for yeah. something, looking for a good, and <clears throat> now you're back into essences. That's I, I think that Lex was trying to get to that conversation and then uh, Rogan did this like materialist trick where he, he just takes something to reduce it to yeah. its parts, which is a very easy trick um, to fall into where, you know, you're just like, why, why do you love your wife? She's just the person you propagate your genes with. Like, right, right. But okay, if you do that ad infinitum, then you're left with everything being reduced to its parts. So why even act? Yeah. And so like Rogan is taking himself out of this picture and being like, well, everything is just this. It's like, then why do you do anything? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Again, like you, now you have to argue to me right. why you're not just going to off yourself to avoid suffering. Yeah. Yeah, Because exactly. why? Yeah. Right. Right. It's an easy philosophy to have, like, when you just view it. Yeah. And propose right. it, as opposed to when you're actually in it, then yep. you, don't, you don't believe it. Yep. Yeah. Because you don't act like that's true. Yeah. It's the scientific problem in general. Right. Like, all of that uh, reduction of science, like, forgets the human consciousness. The subjective element. experience yeah. to it. I also thought, you know, it was kind of funny, but I think there is something to it. When he said, like, you know, and whatever music is. Mm-hmm. And then, like, Rogan, like, you know, flippantly said, like, um, that's the best question, of, yeah. uh, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then he, gl- like, glosses over yeah, it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but here's a better question. Yeah, yeah. So, but um, I think he's right to point to things like music and art. And mm-hmm. It's like, why are we attracted to that when there's no biological benefit right. to that, right? Um, mm-hmm. What is it about those things? Uh, and Plato actually um, mentions, um, I think it's in his Republic when he's talking to Glaucon, he he says um, he 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 makes it almost like a he assumes that people just know that this is right um, that music and poetry is the most foundational of studies um, that man can um, mm-hmm. immerse himself in mm-hmm. um, and he says and he's he's talking from like an intuitive um, position yep. where uh, he Plato's explaining um, that music penetrates the soul and it gives your life an inner consistency of order um, so that when you um, you know, experience the world, you're able to dif- discern like uh, what is off or what is ordered because of the order of music in your soul. Mm. Um, and so for him, like music is very foundational. Yeah. Um, and so it's just, it was a really random thing that they glossed over. Right. But I think it's a very important thing to analyze. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah. All right, let's do a uh, clip two here. Um, kind of along the same lines. I mean, that's the question, the religious question people ask, why does God allow suffering? Right. Why is there evil? Why is there injustice? I think all of these questions are really good questions, but we look at it through the eye of culture. We look at it through the eye of what's meaningful for us. 
what life means to us. But if you could look at it almost like a computation, if you could step away, it's impossible for us to do it, but if you just had to pretend, if you could step away and look at it like this thing is moving in a certain way, like what is it doing? Well, it's making better stuff. That's all it does. All it does is make better stuff. It has a lot of things in there like romance and sound and stories mm-hmm. and the, the hero's journey. But what is it really doing? Input it's is make, energy. It's making stuff. Output is it's making better stuff. stuff. It's making better stuff. But it needs cool. energy. So and you need the input. Thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> um, wait, he's saying, what is it? Like the universe? Yeah. People. People. Yeah. People, so uh, he's like, how, like, how to, what, what is suffering? Why is there suffering? Yeah. He's like asking these questions, and Rogan immediately goes to like, well, let's look at it from a top-down mechanical. Uh, yeah. He said like computation. Yeah, or like, whatever. It's impossible to do it, <laughs> but let's look at it this way. Yeah. Right, and that's, I guess, that's the problem, is that you can never remove yourself from the subjective yeah. experience. You can't. Um, right. And so when you're suffering, you know intuitively that this thing should not be. Right. Yeah. Um, and so. Like, you know, Rogan wants to, like, employ this scientific objective worldview, um, which is, uh, again, it, it, that's that's really Im- impossible. And he admits that's impossible. But the fact that it's impossible shows that that's not a good argument for whatever you're laying down. It's mm-hmm. almost like, like, let's use this contradiction to prove my point. It's like, right. but that's not how we work, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, he also uh, later in that, I don't have the clip of it, but he later uh, kind of draws that out and be like, we just make stuff. Like, this is what humans are doing. We just kind of progress and make better technologies. But he's arguing that that's, that that's, causes suffering? That's like the, that's the human condition. He's like avoiding the question, basically. By just saying like, yeah. you know, yeah, there's suffering, but that's really just like the subjective experience of it. But like when you really just look at it, it's not suffering. We're just like doing things. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like an ant asking, why is the ant suffering? Like, why does ant suffering exist? But, you know, really, it's just, it's building ant hills and propagating its species. That's interesting. I don't... These are surprisingly nihilistic ants. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, you know, I'm serious. For, for Joe Rogan, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, usually he's not so nihilistic. What's interesting, though, he is that, that he, he wouldn't say he is. Like, he's like sure. a hopeful guy who has passion and motivation yeah. and is always encouraging people. So it's like he's in a contradiction, essentially. Right. I think that this like this line of questioning yeah. has pushed him into a yeah. uh, philosophy that he doesn't really live. Right, um, right, right. You know, because when you just keep running with this idea, and that goes back to the first clip of like, you yeah. know, again, in the end, you know, we all die. Mm-hmm. We're all tending towards death. Why are we fighting against that? And yeah. so now he's trying to take himself out of the uh, human experience right. of that mm-hmm. and saying like, well, we're just going to progress. And yeah, yeah, you know, like he's assuming like, well, mm-hmm. we'll all die. Um, right. But objectively, the world will be better. Right. You know? um, it's but, also important yeah. to, to note that he's not like giving a speech on like the, his philosophy of life. He's like yeah. having a conversation. Right. Of but it is yeah. interesting to just kind of peer into that mentality. Yeah. 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 So it seems like suffering is is uh, is viewed from the top as is not really suffering. It's just us kind of going about. I suppose our day, yeah. our lives, and and therefore, as you said, you know, an ant is building something and asks why it's suffering. It's because it's building this thing, but yeah. really, from a higher level, it's not suffering at all. Yeah, or it's like it's not meaningful, or it doesn't yeah. matter that much. And yeah. then, and then he yeah, also takes weird. it to his his, uh, his logical end about like it's really just about the technologies we're making, and that's what humans are doing. That's like how we see that. Um, and then Lex mentions like, yeah, well, that's what Marx thought. Like that, we're just kind of economic, yeah. And we're and then there's a power struggle, so like from there bleeds into like, well, then why is there motivation? Yeah. Like if we're just making cool stuff, why is there motivation? And then various philosophers have had an answer to that, like power, economics, whatever. But the question, the the clip started with Lex saying that suffering is a um, religious question, a religious question, and he said it's um, uh, people you will use suffering against the existence of god Mm -hmm. and so rogan is now running away hard (laughs) well or he's arguing now for the existence of god he's like yeah but suffering's not really like a big deal if you just look at it objectively i I mean so then like he's you know what i'm saying like he's he's actually making um almost like a god of the philosophers move it seems Mm. like so does god will suffering does god will you know terrible earthquakes that happen Mm -hmm. in turkey it's like well no no god wills the generation and regeneration of life 
right. and of the earth mm-hmm. from a, from the highest level. Right. You know, it's it's not that when you die of of your cells breaking down, God doesn't will that your cells break down, but He does right. will that life takes its place mm-hmm. right. or takes uh, takes course. Yep. And but that's a that's like I said, a, a detached, almost like view of yes, of God yeah, yeah, more yeah. than it is of nature. Mm-hmm. It's more that like yeah. there's this thing that just happens, um, and you may you may view it as evil or that God is doing evil to you, mm. but really He's just willing that life take its course. Yeah, does that yeah. make you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it go, it goes back to that idea of just an impersonal view of mm-hmm. the world of of God. Right. Um, I think I don't think Rogan was conscious conscious of like the religious question that was being right. asked yeah. right um yeah. and so in his musing um i think he lost sight that he was actually touching on it uh, I, I got a job vibe almost of like mm. you know when god answers job like why you're suffering it's like yeah. the universe is way bigger than you and you can't understand why you're suffering right um you know and so like uh, there was a little bit of that in there too mm. like it doesn't matter like if we're suffering right. Like, you know, life will just continue right. and, and things are getting better. Right. Um, but the answer, the conclusion is that, like, you know, in Job, it's like, I have a plan. For your or, life. Right, yeah. yeah As yeah, opposed yeah, to, course, like, there is course. no plan. No, no, right, right, <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that, that line that Joe Rogan's walking can either kind of go a Job route, yeah. could go a Buddhist route. Mm-hmm. A nihilistic route. Could go yeah. a nihilistic route. It, <laughs> yeah. It's any one of those, depending upon right. uh, where he decides that the yeah. end point is. Yeah, and if he thinks that that becomes the, like, this is what humans are about, then it's like, is that, like, select for the people who can understand that? Like, you said, like, the god of the philosophers? And then what what do you make of human motivation? Yeah. Like, what if we fully wrapped our heads around, like, what's really going on? We're just kind of propagating our species, and we're just making cool stuff. Like, all right, then why do I got to get up in the morning? Why do I got to take my kid to school? Why do, like, yeah, why do I right. care about any of this? It's yeah. got to mean something, unless you just think it's all one big trick. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, I'll go along for the trick, because it's fun. Like that's yeah. kind of nihilistic, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And, and the first clip too, going back, I, I feel like, um, Rogan was a little um, dismissive of Lex's, um, pushback. Yeah. Um. You know, he like Lex was like, "That's too simplistic," and he mm-hmm. was just like, "Of course, of course, like of course it is." It's like, no, 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 but like talk about that, you know, instead yeah. of just. Uh, it, it sounded like he wanted to just kind of close the conversation quickly instead of actually giving it some due thought, so. Yeah. Um, let me play uh, clip three here. Uh, Lex is asking about whether or not extending life indefinitely is beneficial. Why or why not? Uh, stories like Brave New World paint an end point to this trajectory that's not... There, there, there it's not could, good. There could be an optimal place where you stop, right? Mm. It's a, like, of course, it's tempting to say, now we're in the optimal place, but it's it's not obvious to me. For example, uh, there's many brilliant people that are working to extend life, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, extending the quality of life, improving the quality of life is a really worthy pursuit. It's an obvious pursuit, and it should be... Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's fascinating, it's a beautiful one we should invest in, but do you want to live forever? That's a not... That's a, To me, a lot of people say, like, Yes, you should be able to choose uh, when you die, which means it's not obvious that living forever is going to maximize uh, happiness. It's there, there could be death, the fear of death, the finiteness of things, the finiteness of experience that are, that are pleasurable is part of the human condition. It's not obvious to me if you remove that, that that's not going to significantly uh, decrease the, the amount of happiness. Well, it will decrease life. the amount of happiness. It's like, have you ever played a video game on God mode? Yeah, exactly. It's boring as fuck. Yeah. Just what running around shooting everything. Because there's no consequence. Yeah. Yeah, there's no consequence. We, we desire consequence. Um, so, in an apparent contradiction, <laughs> Rogan is implying that we need a story. Because consequence is like consequence. So, like, mm. with a sequential order. So, he's like, yeah, we, well, we need consequence. Like, we need... Story, a logic, like, a logic yeah. behind which previously he's like, yeah, you know, like we make cool stuff, and then there's like stories and the hero's <laughs> journey. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. I just thought that was really interesting on how it is an interesting question of is the fear of death a Motivator. motivating factor? Yeah. Like, and we do get to the point where we can extend life indefinitely as a theory. It would that completely remove that element of people's motivation and kind of crush that human condition. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Pope Benedict talked about this in Spet Salve. Mm. He said, what, what is eternal life? 
and do we actually want to live eternally? Mm. And he says that this is perhaps why people reject the faith is because the idea of eternal life isn't attractive. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it reveals death and eternal life reveals sort of this inner contradiction and paradox. Mm. He says within man that on one hand, we don't want to die. But on the other, we're not sure if we want to live eternally in the present either. Mm-hmm. Right. So what is it that we want? And what is eternal life? Yep. What is life itself? Right. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, because I, I think that a lot of people, Pope Benedict says this as well, that they, they kind of view eternal life as the endless sequence mm-hmm. of, of days mm-hmm. as opposed to an eternal moment of satisfaction. There's, there's no beginning right. and end. There's no before or after. Um, but because we think of eternal life as it is now, yeah. living now, it's, it seems like a curse. Because I don't think mm-hmm. people want, you know, as much as uh, the vampire fiction is popular, I don't think people want to <laughs> yeah. live right. as, you know, as... As, as humans forever. Yeah. I, I think Lex is really onto something there. Yeah. It's kind of like how, uh, what is the line in the Bible? Um, like, all that will remain is love. Like, these three, faith, hope, and love, but oh, all that yeah. will remain is love. Mm-hmm. So it's like faith and hope have that element of, like, future looking. Yeah. Of, like, taking a leap of faith and, like, hoping to the future. But So if those things go away, that means there's, like, an eternal nowness that eternity is. And so it's not like infinite days it's like no it's like there is no hope not because it's hopeless but because it's been fulfilled yeah and so it's like ever presence right right um so right. it is a different experience than just life again and again and again and again yeah. right um, so yeah to your point that, that those are different things that people i think that people get those mixed up yeah no that's exactly right we await a new heaven and a new earth mm. um so where all things will be redeemed and our hope in eternal life is not just um living forever amidst suffering and death, right? Um, our, our entire existence will be um, transformed um, and, and made, it will be renewed. Mm-hmm. Um, so that hope for eternal life is not just um, a biological living, but it's like a, it's a, it's, it's a fullness right. um, in everything. So it, It's interesting because Pope Benedict also mentions that it's, it's, there's this unknown thing within man that almost like drives him to this, this point of, of wanting eternal life, but he doesn't know, he, he doesn't know what it is. Like we do want life untouched by death. Right. Which in, in more specific terms is eternal mm-hmm. life. But if you don't have that concept, if you don't have that story, yeah, then you're not really sure what's driving you to that point, but you know that you are right. You know, it's not this life again, it's that paradox. Yeah. You know you don't want to live this life eternally, but you also want life untouched by death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So what? What's like? What's going on here? Mm-hmm. And I think this is this, the like this was the ancient question. Mm. That I think really tormented, you know, the ancient philosophers and and yeah. sages and such like that. Is we we want re- to return to this paradise that Lex is I think talking about. Um, that's what Brave New World sort of pictures is, mm-hmm. is a paradise where everything's taken care of yep. for you. Um, even the Matrix actually um, mm-hmm. kind of uh, yeah. has that. It, it, the, before the the battle, if you if you've watched the Matrix, before the battle with the machines, mm-hmm. life becomes basically like endless pleasure because they have robots right. to do everything for them, so they can just yep um, enjoy. They can just enjoy life, but then it becomes a life without consequence. Mm-hmm. Um, but but. Um, I, you know, many great saints have talked about that death actually is, death is what makes life meaningful. Yeah. There has to be like an end yep. to this end, endless sequence. Right. But, and that's what, you know, the, when you read the Gospels, like, yes, you know, Christ has given us eternal life, but the climax of the story is the cross. It's, it's not the resurrection. The resurrection, of course, is what makes the cross meaningful and, and, and actually there's hope after mm-hmm. that, right? Um, and, and the resurrection is the, like the, the catalyst for our faith. But... Um, it's there is no resurrection without the cross, and that's built into our human nature now. Mm. Now that like Christ has revealed man to man, He showed us like what it takes to gain that eternal life. Um, there is no resurrection, no eternal life if we don't go through that suffering now. And so, once you have that suffering, once you accept death, mm-hmm. then you're open for eternal life, and you have the whole picture. Um, and this is also, you know, you look at like the. Um, uh, 
kind of the like the cliche image of um you know the soldiers um like medieval soldiers like wanting death for glory right um they're actually hope they're actually wanting death um but that's in light of their legacy living on right for glory um and so that desire for death is always connected to eternal life and that eternal life is always propagated on um connected to um death uh, you yep. can't really separate the two so yeah that's a good point um all right last clip on uh lex kind of is talking about the public discourse and notices that um it seems that the people who are critical and cynical seem like they get uh people view them as smarter than those who are optimistic this is an interesting observation thing the uh people that are cynical and say that everything is burning down are somehow just by that statement seen as more intelligent i've just observed right. this is weird yeah like, it is weird the reality is the people that are building this stuff are usually optimistic now you could say they're too optimistic but like if you actually want to build a better world you're usually going to be more optimistic the people that are considered intelligent are the ones that are going to be a little more cynical i think there's a balance there that's kind of nice because it's like the, you need the critic it's, uh, yeah. it's not the critic that counts, but you need the critic in order for the people not to run away with uh, into the bad direction. Well, so just really interesting point about kind of uh, that hermeneutic of suspicion, if you will, um, being kind of like the the mood of the culture. And so anybody who's critical and suspicious is usually held as like, oh, they know more, as opposed to somebody who has kind of. Uh, just a disposition of beauty or just admiring things or wanting to build things, having a vision as seen as more like hopeless, romantic, yep. or just kind of, you know, pie in the sky shooter. Um, yeah, I don't know what you guys think about that. Well, I think that I was reminded of um, Peterson's uh, explanation of uh, like this innocence and naivete when you're first, you know, when you're, you, when you're young, right? Because you haven't been you haven't experienced the world yet and you haven't been rejected. You haven't been, um, you know, you haven't been met with grave obstacles because you're kind of sheltered in your home. Um, and so naivete can, um, almost, it, it almost presupposes that you're young, right. And, and you're just, um, yeah, your innocence and your uh, optimism is connected to a na naivete, I should say. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it's not until like you've actually encountered the world where you've, um, you know, you've been rejected, you've, you know, gone up against obstacles, that that innocence fades away and it's very easy to become cynical. Right. And so c cynicism, I think, is connected with maturity, that you've experienced the world. Um, optimism is connected to a, a youthfulness. Mm. But I remember Peterson making this point, saying, <clears throat> imagine, you know, you, you've been rejected and then you strive to uh, regain that sense of optimism. Mm -hmm then that optimism is not naivete but it's actually hope right where you you understand what it's like to be cynical you understand that the world is a dangerous place but you live in opposition to that and say i can still live a good and beautiful life now um so while cynicism is always a um an indicator of um someone mature someone who has mm -hmm. encountered the world naivete innocence optimism can go both ways it's either right. like you're young mm -hmm. and, and that's what we tend to right. think uh, when we hear of optimism mm -hmm. but it can also be on the other side of cynicism as well right does that make sense like yep. yeah. yeah that's so, why christ says like unless you become like children you yeah. will not enter the kingdom of heaven it's like you have to regain that hope and that optimism that like vision yeah. of beauty as opposed to just kind of cynically tearing everything down yeah yeah if there's like a you have hope because you haven't experienced the pain of yeah. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you the assumption. You, right, yeah. you still have hope yeah. because mm -hmm. you don't know how bad things can mm -hmm. be. Right. Um, but it seems like everybody has some sort of hope, you, you know, even today, because you put your hope in science. Yeah. You put your hope in economics or politics or yeah, something right. like that. Right. I don't know if there's anyone who's truly hopeless. Yeah. I think it's... Um, like you said, uh, depending upon where you place your hope or how you portray it, you're seen as young and naive. Yeah. I think there's, it, it seems as though those who have, those who are cynical are cynical because they've seen the world for the way it really is. 
yeah, um, yeah. I mean, exactly. and that's mm-hmm. that's the great project of the um the I guess the the pillars of the hermeneutic of suspicion, mm-hmm. Freud, Nietzsche, right. and Marx, that they all pulled the veil back. Right. I mean, yeah. Freud pulled the veil back and said, uh, "What you're, what's actually going on is unconscious psychic activity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's really it's he was a materialist. It's your brain yeah. that's doing everything. Nietzsche, you know, all these you know, holy desires are really just the will to power mm-hmm. and in resentment. And I'll right. show you how the world really really right. works." Um, you know, uh, your your hope in in this afterlife is ultimately nihilistic because yeah. you de- degrade this world and such like that. Right. Um, yeah, I think there. I I hadn't really thought about it until I heard Lex say it, but you're right. There are people that the cynics do seem, yeah, smarter or more yeah. respected. Yeah, it's and it's true. Like he said, you know, you do need the critic, and like yeah. we said last week, I think you mentioned that. Um, ideologies are half truths, right? And so, like, there is an element that uh, we are motivated by power, and you know, economic forces, and we have to keep that in check to make sure that that's not our driving force into why we do things. Um, so, having a critic kind of pull the veil back and be like, "What's really going on?" is necessary, but yeah. it's not the whole picture, right? Yeah, I mean, and approaching something, uh, you know, that hermene- hermeneutic of um, suspicion versus the hum- hermeneutic of Beauty, I think, mm-hmm. is the other one. Yeah, or faith. Right, where, where that's John Verveke's mm-hmm. terms. Um, whenever you're approaching something, it could be seen as a higher sign of intelligence if you're immediately critical of it. Um, but I think it's healthier for you if you can, if you're open to whatever you're approaching, to get the good out of it and then make distinctions, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Um, and that's the whole point of philosophy. Um, the the pursuit of wisdom is to. Um, distinguish like okay what part of this is bad what part of this is good what is valuable here why are we attracted to this Mm -hmm. the more distinctions you can make um you're not necessarily falling on the side of the critic or the side of the optimist Mm -hmm. um it's a give and take you have to approach life with both you have to um starting off i think though with this um with more optimism is probably a a healthier um thing to do (laughs) for oneself right um but that is not negating Again, the point of the critic. We right. need that. Even everybody has to be a critic with whatever they're um, yeah. intaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, speaking of cynicism, I wanted to talk a little bit about <laughs> some of the kind of infighting on the quote-unquote right side of politics right now with like the Daily Wire and Crowder. Uh, Tim Pool and the Quartering had a, a beef. Um, but we'll save that for the bonus episode. Um, so you guys can go to basicallyrelated.com to sign up. Uh, and hear the rest of this conversation.